Hi, everyone. I hope the word of God finds you alive and uh, healthy today. And I pray that uh, as we go into the portion of the word of God today, you'll find health and you'll find life for yourself. Overall, I pray that the word of God will be of benefit to you. And uh, on your part, you will bring glory to God. We're continuing on our series on the shield of God. And today we're going to be talking about how our priority can expose us for good or for bad. And for these, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, uh, the book of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 6, verses 7 to 8. Don't be missold. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. I'll begin simply by saying that our appetite, among so many things that it influences, can also influence the things we prioritize or what we choose to prioritize. It's very important. And uh, uh, our priority is extremely important because it determines exactly what we love, what we want to surrender to, what we want to yield to. Uh, I used to know a young man uh, who, who told me, he said when he was in the bondage of sexual sin before Jesus came into his life, and one of the things that held him hostage was once he set his eyes on a woman, once he makes up that desire to want that woman, if it took him six months or nine months, he will go to the same spot every day until he grabs that girl. And I was just thinking, so what if when it rains, as I go, well, what if you don't have money? I'll walk. Uh, because it's a priority for him. And, and the Apostle Paul calls such a priority enslavement. He says, don't you realize that the things that you submit yourself to, you are enslaved to that thing. It's funny, right? Our appetite, among so many other things that it influences, can also influence the things that we choose as our priority. Our appetite makes us decide whether we're going to obey God. Our appetite makes us decide whether God's law is valid or not. Our appetite makes us decide whether we like to live long or we want to die early. Somebody may say, who chooses to die early? Well, our appetite makes us prioritize what we want to see happen in our lives. Uh, this is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very sad one. I'll tell you the story in our country. Uh, there's something they call uh, youth service. It's a system where when you graduate from the college, the first year, the government expects you to serve the country. I don't know why, because they don't offer you anything, rather they waste your time, but let's put that politics aside. They ask you to serve your country. And then in that one year, you are supposed to be posted to any part of the country to serve in whatever area the government considers there is a need. And so there happens to be a young man who liked a girl in an area where the culture is a little bit, it's very shy, where you are not allowed to mingle with the women from that culture. And so this young man devised a means because these ladies in those areas, they are often covered. And this young woman, man decided to dress like a woman. I am sure that on the day he was caught, that was not the first time. He might have been doing it and it worked for him. He will dress like a woman 
and go in to see this young other woman. Apparently, the woman that he was seeing was somebody's wife. And on this day of reckoning, I don't call it unfortunate, on this day of reckoning, he dressed like a woman. Somebody might have him informed the husband. And so he waited. He waited with the machetes. And as soon as the man entered, and on, I don't know whatever else he did, his head was chopped off. And just imagine the sorrow, the pain, the disaster that it provoked. But he chose to die early. It sounds harsh, but it is the truth. So he was nursed from infancy to teenager, to an adult, to a university graduate that had a few more months of his life to be free to do what he wants to do. But he prioritized his desire to be with somebody else's wife. And the consequence was that he literally had sentenced himself to death. Am I saying that I approve of his death? Of course not. Am I saying whoever killed him had the right to do? Of course not. But he broke a law by the priority that he gave for himself. The Apostle Paul in the sixth chapter of Galatians, chapter seven begins by saying, don't missile yourself. In other words, don't pretend that you're surprised when your consequences strike you. Don't deceive yourself because your, your, your choice is already determining what is going to happen to you. And, and whether you like it or not, you are going to face a certain, uh, a, a certain consequence because of the priority that you make. You know, the apostle wasn't stupid when he said this because I see people literally acting surprised after the consequence of their priority strikes them. A young man is zooming through the road 120 miles per hour and the car flies out and he kills somebody and he's surprised. What are you surprised about? You already told yourself you want to kill somebody when you are flying across the road at such a speed. There's nothing to be surprised about. If you are getting an outcome in your life that you do not like or want, well, the reason is simple. Please help me or hear this. The reason is you cannot beat God's law of order and justice. There is a precept. There is a standard of God's law. There is a standard that he has set. It is also tied to a law of cause and effect. We cannot beat it. Of course, we are under grace. We can say we are sorry. We can be redeemed back. But we cannot beat the consequence of God's law, his order and justice. Sadly, in our 21st century culture and our current atmosphere of things, where nothing is white or black, where nothing is non, not now male or female, where nothing is no, no, no longer tied to any consequence, eh? we choose to act one way, but we don't like the outcome that comes with the choice that we prioritize. But we are getting the choice daily. You know, I was speaking to some young people and one of the things that this young person was saying, well, I don't judge anybody. Of course, the scripture says don't judge anybody, but take a side. Because whether you choose to be neutral or not, your very act of being neutral is a choice. A lot of people don't like to know that. Well, I am not choosing a side. And I want everything to just go the way they are. You have made a choice. You have prioritized your non-partisan and you're going to get a choice for what you do. Our culture wants to eat its cake and still have it. And the apostle came to say, Don't, you can't mock the justice of God. It is true that God is long suffering. My goodness, I wake up every day to thank God for that long suffering because we wouldn't be here had he not made that choice available. 
I tell you, he's a God of order, but we cannot mock his justice, no matter what it is. The apostle makes it clear that we will always reap a commensurate value to what we sow. You will always reap it. It may surprise you, but we will reap it. In the particular verse that I read, the third phrase there is, you will always reap what you sow. Here, the apostle. You will always reap, always harvest what you plant, NLT. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. In other words, those who only prioritize their sinful nature will only harvest decay and death from that sinful priority that they have made. But those who live to please the spirit, but those who live to prioritize the spirit will only harvest everlasting life from the spirit. You know, those days when computer programming was still very much in its infancy, there's a basic language they call GW basic. Garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you put in is what comes out. Whatever you put in is your priority. Anybody who is programming at that time, you work hard to get to that point where you want to program that thing. And whatever you put in at that time is what you will get. The reality of our priority is extremely frightening. The fact that we walk with the spirit, we reap eternal life, or the fact that we choose to sow to the flesh and we reap decay and death is a frightening thing. You know, the neutralists, the pacifists, the don't bother other people might say, well, if I stay in the middle, I'm not causing problem, whether on the left or on the right. Well, it doesn't work like that. Even my middle ground has become a ground for which there will be a choice whether I like it or not. Hear what the Lord Jesus says concerning the frightening choice of our priority. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 to 33, it says, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. It is a very frightening choice. Our appetite, no doubt, has a tremendous influence upon our priorities. Nevertheless, our priorities has very far-reaching effect that we may need to give attention to. I think that anybody under the influence of my voice today needs to just slow down and say, what do I prioritize? If a person says, I don't really know, then you have already deceived yourself. Your, 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 your denial is a priority in your life. So we have to just stop and ask ourselves, what is priority in my life? Is it life? Is it death? Is it decay? Because whether I like it or not, I am going to reap the consequence of my choice. God's law and order cannot be broken. If we sow to the flesh, we prioritize the flesh. Then we will definitely reap decay. But if we sow to the spirit, we prioritize God in our choice. Then the harvest will lead to eternal life. Friends, what this means is that our priority is influenced by our appetite. The thing that is propelling you, your propensity from the deep inside, they are very much able to become what you prioritize. If you sow to the spirit, automatically your position in the presence of God and him being your shield will be consolidated. There is no way the devil is going to come and pass through that because you have fallen in line with the will of God. In Psalm 34, verse 19 to 22, it says, The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to rescue him each time. 
because I had to put this there. Somebody would say, Pastor Tony, well, you don't know what is going on. I've been suffering. I didn't say you won't suffer. Did I say that? For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous, and not one of them is broken. Calamity will surely destroy the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him, those who prioritize God. No one who takes refuge in God will be condemned. No one is saying troubles may never come. Because we are in a broken world, yet God's laws are immutable. He will not shortchange himself. He will always honor his word. And if he's our priority, then he will prioritize us. Isn't that something? If I prioritize God, then God prioritizes me. If I say, Lord, I lift you high, and the God will say, Tony, I promote you. It is just a simple arithmetic. You prioritize him, he prioritizes you. It is not that difficult to understand. In Psalm 25, verses 1 to 3, it says, Oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you. My God, do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. And this psalm, like I say, is a phenomenal one because it reveals to us what happens when we prioritize God. It's saying, Lord, I lift you high. You are my life. I trust you. And the, the consequence of that is you will never be disgraced. Your enemy, they may fight you. They may throw slow at you. They may slow you down for a moment, but you will eventually overtake your enemy one at a time, and all of them. God is our hiding place. Since God is our hiding place, a compromise on the position we hold will compromise our position. I don't know if you understand this logic. If God is your tent, if you compromise that tent, then your protection within that tent is also compromised. It is very simple. And this is one of the things that sins, sin usually hide from us. Sin makes us prioritize our initial desire over God and his laws every time. It makes us ignore the reality that we are dealing with a God that cannot be manipulated. Worse still, it makes us forget the consequence of such a choice and its effect upon our position in Christ. Hey, when sin is coming to talk to you and beg you to take part in him or her, whatever gender you want to give sin, it never tells you all the consequences. It never tells you that you are probably going to compromise God as your shield. It never tells you that there is a consequence you cannot overcome. It never tells you that your position in Christ can be jeopardized. It isn't, it, of course, I'm not saying you will be unsaved. I'm just saying your standing in Christ will be compromised. Sin binds us to how prioritizing can influence the position we are supposed to have in Christ. It blinds you so that you cannot say, I am in Christ, and then you want sin to continue. You cannot. The scripture says we cannot again crucify the Son of God to ourselves. We cannot step upon the blood of the Prince of God and say, well, there's not going to be any consequence. We are being blinded. The truth is that every time we are in this situation, we don't even realize because our appetite has provoked a certain priority in us. Hey, wherever you are, am I saying that you cannot sin? Of course. That's why John said, if anyone sins, we have an advocate, Jesus. But I am saying that if the core of our desire, the spirit man inside us, chooses to prioritize the things that are contrary to the laws and the order and the justice of God, our position naturally is compromised. We have chosen to turn out of the grace that God has given to us, and there will be consequences. 
Dear friends, I would like to bring this teaching to an end today by saying that the idea of this is that there is lot, a lot to do with the choice that I make in my everyday today work as a child of God. My priority, my priority can expose me to the blessings of God. It has that potential and grants me a superb consolidation in the position that I am or have in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, my priority can expose me to undesired consequence. So much so that I will be asking the question, why is God not helping me at this time? Well, I want to say God is always helping. The problem is simple. My appetite has designed my priority and my priority has given me the position that I deserve. The scripture says, if any man sins, there's an advocate. That's part of the thing that this series is really going for. Let us go back to our advocate. Let us ask that the blood that was shed will touch us and sanctify us and grant us the grace to re re uh, ignite the joy of salvation that we have. I pray for you, my dear friends. Before I go, I would like to make this uh, call that if there's anybody who is suffering with the priorities that they make, I understand because we are all flesh and blood and that is why Jesus died. I would like you to just say with me, dear father, I recognize myself. I recognize the foundation of my choices. I will ask today that your mighty hand will touch me for a change. Father, let the hold of my wrong appetite that has decided the painful priorities in my life be broken today. Holy Spirit, I ask that your touch will be upon everyone who is saying this prayer at this moment. Father, let the joy of salvation resound in everyone under the influence of my voice today. In your precious and holy name we have prayed. Amen.